Via telephone, Attorney Joseph Ferretti is there. Joe, good morning to you. Good morning, fellas. Great to have you on the program three days in a row, Joe, or three shows in a row. Thursday, Friday, and now Monday. It's like yeah, you never I moved. Can't wait to pick, I, I can't wait to pick up my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> you can get yours where, where Gilstrap and Stubblefield get theirs. Yeah. If you, if, if you get one significantly larger than ours, then it does not have to be very much to be significantly larger. Let us know, Joe. We'd like to share. Boy, there's a lot of complaining going on around this show today. I want to speak to my union rep. Between deleted, between com people complaining about getting deleted to the, to the pay scale around here, there's a lot of complaints. But the one thing, and Joe should receive more because he's added an audio, I mean, not a, a video factor that we appreciate, and that's that picture of him on the beach that we've gotten a lot of mileage out of. A lot of, of mileage. The best picture really? there was Gilstrap's face being <laughs> photoshopped in there. You have to go there, Bill. Really. <laughs> well, you go back to the shower scene all the time, so it's a fair, fair enough. Oh, yeah, that's Bill's way of getting even. I like that. Uh, Joe, we spoke with you last week at the, the, toward the end of the week about the indictments that came from the grand jury regarding Sheriff Nate Harmon. Uh, and then today, following a Friday afternoon release of a 41-count indictment involving Melissa Joanna Beavers, a uh, former employee with the county clerk's office. And uh, we're bringing you in again for your expertise on this one. You have a copy of the indictment, and you've read through the 41 counts. Uh, summarize the gist of this one for us. Wow, a rather large assumption about my reading. <laughs> <laughs> totally true. But, but, but in, in this case, in, in terms of show prep, I have read through the uh, 41 count indictment. And I, I think it's important to state, as we always do, Rob, and as we did last week involving the indictment of uh, Sheriff Harmon, uh, that we always want to preface our comments by claiming that these are charges, okay, and, and there will be defenses to these charges, and you have to let that whole scenario play out in the court system. So what we endeavor to do as part of the show is to simply state what we know based on public filings in the courts, and we don't offer any uh, we try not to offer any comments about uh, the validity, uh, the truthfulness, or lack of truthfulness regarding these charges. Everybody is presumed innocent at this stage, even when they're under indictment, because there's nothing more with indictments to, than notice to a defendant that the charges shall be brought by the state, and here are the charges. So the state will be will put to the task of proving their case beyond a reasonable doubt, and the defendant will have an opportunity to respond. So having said all that, uh, these indictments are concern the county clerk's office, and and essentially the claims are uh, misappropriation of funds. Embezzlement is the legal term for it, and, and that's right from the West Virginia Code. Uh, and the claims pretty much uh, have to do with one employee, Melissa Beavers, accused of uh, – misappropriating or stealing money from the county clerk's office in multiple occasions. And that's why there are 41 counts, because each occasion where there's been a claim that she forged checks or took cash and somehow uh, balanced out the accounts through some allegations that she marked up the accounts in a certain way or failed to register the payments uh, that were made on certain occasions with the county clerk's office. She converted county money to her own personal use, and that's why there are multiple counts. Uh, some of these have to do with forging and uttering checks payable to a company called Beavers Construction, which I can only assume is some sort of family connection. Uh, there's multiple counts having to do with payments to that business. Uh, there's also allegations that uh, other money was taken for, for personal use, just taken in terms of cash. Uh, and, 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 you know, she allegedly left the uh, county office buildings with that cash in hand. And uh, then there's also interesting uh, other counts that have to do with her uh, forging signatures uh, on a um, 
what's called a divorce packet, and it has to do with a divorce case involving a Daniel Beepers, who, again, we can only presume is some family member, but there are multiple counts having to do with Ford's signatures in that divorce case, and there are numerous pleadings and filings where there are accusations of that kind of conduct, so that also contributes to the number of counts that are pending in this case. Yeah, Bill? Joe, uh, she also she was able to do this because I understand she stole a, a notary stamp and used that to uh, uh, to hide the fact that she was forging and embellishing. Uh, I do not see a count that actually theft. Uh, is that except perhaps count 40, keeping a concealing instrument for forging? Uh, would that not be a standalone count, the, the theft of? It, it is. Uh, and and I, my understanding, Bill, is that what tipped off uh, other county officials to some alleged nefarious conduct here was the use of a notary stamp belonging to another employee. Uh, I I believe that there's information out there that that employee had left the employment of the county clerk's office and that uh, allegedly Melissa Beavers then uh, obtained that notary stamp. It was still active, meaning it was – because when you have a notary stamp or seal – it is uh, active for a set number of years, and then every so often that has to be renewed. I believe this was still an active notary stamp, even though the employee who uh, uh, that stamp belonged to was no longer in the county clerk's office. Allegedly, Melissa Beavers then obtained that stamp and continued to certify documents with a notary stamp that did not belong to her. Yeah, I gather, and I well, from all reports from the county council, county commission now, uh, that uh, Tony Petrucci, uh, who is now the uh, county clerk, uh, uh, deserves a lot of credit for picking up the the, the discrepancy in reporting to the proper officials. Yeah, I, and uh, Tony issued a statement, Bill, uh, indicating that. Uh, uh, Joe, I'll read it while, for a moment here. Yeah, Berkeley good. County yeah, Clerk ahead. Anthony. It's, it's good for clarification. Yeah, yeah I want to make sure we're exact on this. Berkeley County Clerk Anthony J. Tony Petrucci issued the following statement in response to the indictment of Melissa Beavers, a former deputy clerk in the county clerk's office. Melissa Beavers, who has been indicted on multiple counts of embezzlement and forgery, has not worked in the county clerk's office since I took office January 1, 2023, Petrucci said. Shortly after I took office, I discovered what appeared to be misuse of public funds coming into the county clerk's office. I immediately invited law enforcement and the state auditor to investigate the matter. Since first discovering the issue, the county clerk's office has assisted investigators and instituted a number of changes to how cash, Fees, deposits, and checks are processed through the county clerk's office so that something like this never happens again. I appreciate the assistance of the state auditor's office in identifying exactly what occurred and how best to prevent it in the future. Joe? Yeah, uh, so Tony makes it clear that uh, this was discovered upon his uh, entry into the office. And uh, uh, as one would expect of a public official, if there's evidence of, of wrongdoing in that office you refer to the legal authorities in this case that would be the county sheriff's office the prosecuting attorney's office and then you contact the state auditor's office which has uh, investigators who are able to come in and actually do some forensic work looking through the county records to determine okay do we have missing funds and if so uh, where might they be how much is involved and who may be responsible for uh, uh, pirating away those funds. And, and that's, uh, I think that's what's happened in this case now, and that ultimately resulted in these indictments. John? Joe, this is John. Uh, I'm really interested in the structure of this indictment. I don't read a lot of indictments. Um, count one is the embezzlement of approximately $145,000. Then count two is the falsification of documents as, as part of the county clerks. Then counts three through many are the mm-hmm. the individual checks that um, 
that ultimately add up. I presume I didn't do the math. It add up to the hundred and forty five thousand dollars. But for each check, that's broken down into two counts. You've got the writing of the check and then the uttering of the check, which I presume is the cashing of it. Yes. Is is this typical? It seems like a lot of overkill for you know, the crime is the embezzlement. And I guess each each time you write a bad check, that's a crime. But it's the, the process of writing a check is one, forging a check is one crime, and then cashing the check is a, actually a second crime? That's correct. Uh, it's the presentment of the check, which becomes the uttering uh, uh, when you're presented to a financial institution to have that check converted to, to cash. Uh, that, that is an act that is criminal in nature, as is the forging of a signature on a public record or public document. So those are those are standalone crimes, as, as you indicated, John, and they each deserve a count in an indictment because it falls under separate sections of the West Virginia Code. We actually have uh, a code section for forging, again, public documents or records, and, and, and that was done either with uh, a notary seal or in the and, – in one case, an electronic signature of a uh, family court judge, uh, Sally Jackson. There's an allegation in, in these uh, indictments that, that her signature was placed on a, an official public record or document with the use of an electronic signature. Uh, and so each of those acts, whether you're affixing a signature to a document or then subsequently presenting that that check or draft for conversion to funds, each of those is a standalone crime, and that's why you can end up with 41 counts. And interestingly, a lot of these uh, counts regarding forgery and uttering, uh, they all rise to the level of a felony because uh, they meet the monetary threshold between misdemeanor and felony, which I believe is $1,000, but don't quote me on that because I'm not familiar with that section of the code. So if it turns out that this Beaver's roof repair, I put allegedly in front of all of this, right, because of what we're talking about. If Beaver's roof repair then cashed the check, knowing that it was a fraudulent check, is that Mm -hmm. yet another potential crime? If there's knowledge behind that, indeed, uh, and uh, you have to wonder, and we can only speculate at this point, if there is an investigation into that company for being a knowing recipient of funds that belong to the county. Uh, and again, because of the name of that company, Beaver's Roof Repair, you have to believe that there is some familiar uh, relationship there. So, I, yeah, you can easily imagine that the investigation may extend beyond Melissa Beaver's. Some people have asked on Facebook, John, before you continue, what the time frame is on this. And according to the indictment, it's between, <coughs> excuse me, the 17th day of October 2019 and the 21st day of December 2022. And the amount uh, in uh, count one embezzlement uh, brings up a total of approximately $145,000 belonging to the Berkeley County Clerk's Office. Go ahead, John. I just think it's astonishing how quickly the charges add up for for something like this. I mean, 41 counts. Um, I, there's really no comment there. It's just the, the, the power of the law, uh, excuse me, well, the, yeah, I guess the power of the law and to and how, and how quickly felonies uh, propagate in, it's just, I find it, I find it surprising. Yes, and, 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 this, and John, the scary thing for, for this defendant is that for each felony count, you're, you're looking at a potential sentence of not less than 10 years Oof. on each count. So uh, <laughs> uh, you can imagine that uh, someone faced with, with these, this kind of indictment is going to uh, uh, marshal all their resources available to try and defend on this because this, this potentially could be a life sentence. Yeah. Joe, does it make any difference for the Beavers uh, Roof Repair is a legitimate company or not? The reason I'm asking, I've been Googling it. I can find a lot of roof repair companies in the Eastern Panhandle, but Beavers is not one of them listed. Yeah, I think one of the first things investigators will, will do, Bill, is look with the uh, business registry records with the West Virginia Secretary of State 
uh, when you incorporate in West Virginia or you have a business that uh, intends to do business within the, uh, the boundaries of the state, uh, typically the first thing you do is register as a business, and the Secretary of State's office maintains that business registry. So I'm sure people are looking into whether or not this company has actually gone through the formalities of being a registered corporation to do business. I got a text uh, from somebody that said Melissa's husband owns Beaver's Roof Repair. She took care of the accounting for the business, okay. This okay. the yeah. relationship there. Good. And again, uh, mm. allegedly. Yeah. Uh, is in front of everything that we're doing here. Now, there there was rumored to be anywhere from a three hundred to four hundred thousand uh, dollars embezzlement here. This indictment covers one hundred forty five thousand dollars of it. I don't know if that's the grand sum total or if there's more to come, but there were uh, rumors of a much larger amount. Even so, Bill, former county commission president, what are the checks and balances that were in place when you were there? to make sure that something like this, which took place over a two-plus-year period, wasn't ongoing. And if it was, it didn't go over a two-plus-two-year period before it was finally discovered when a new clerk came into office. There are procedures, but if you look at every check that's written, I think the procedures become more casual through time. They should not get more casual, but just by the sheer volume and the fact that so rarely is there embellishment uh, or forgery or something of this nature that you uh, you do not scrutinize, scrutinize much. We do the same thing with, uh, with all the boards, the water board, the sewer board, the fire board. We go through the check, uh, uh, check accounts on a monthly basis with the attempt to try to pick up something like this. Uh, and on with smaller numbers, I think we do a pretty good job. I'm not sure they can excuse this. I'm not sure they're even going to try to excuse it. I would like to flip the coin and say that more credit is due to Tony Petrucci for finding that. And he, he that's Tony's nature. He's a very meticulous, he's a very thorough individual. So it does not surprise me that Tony was the one to find it. Was the time frame that mentioned is is this uh, strictly in the John Small tenure with some of this Elaine Mox tenure as well? I think it's Elaine Mox. I I because you, know, you you go back to nineteen. I think that's still John Small in office at that point, is it not? That that's correct. Is, is Elaine Mock in office when this is still going on, or does this time frame not include her installation as the clerk? Uh, no, I, I think it it spans both of their tenure. At, at the uh, county clerk's office, and and again, that's that's not to say that either one is is uh, guilty of you know looking the other way or not being vigilant in terms of how they they ran the office. I, I think there's a lot of the investigation that remains to be done, but uh, my understanding is going back to 19, 2019, this would encompass both. Uh, the time when John Small served there and when Elaine Mock served. I'm not sure that's right, Joe, and I, I'm, I'm guessing because Tony was elected in 2020 and Elaine had been in position for, uh, for several months, at least 10, 11 months before the election happened. Tony was elected in 20? Wasn't he elected in 2020? I think 22. I think 2022. Yeah, 22, Bill. May well have been okay, yeah. and these are not yeah. insignificant numbers. We got thirty five hundred bucks, forty two hundred bucks, forty nine hundred bucks. Um, it I keeps th- increasing as the yeah. time goes along it's, to thirty nine thousand, yeah. ninety nine, like almost ten thousand dollars on on one of these checks. Uh, those somebody well, it, should be noticing. It goes that. to twenty something, and then I think thirty nine thousand. I think is the last entry, Joe. Yeah, and, and I think it's important to understand where all this money is coming from, uh, and, and so that people understand right. what the the, the role of the county clerk's office is the county clerk receives uh probably on a daily basis uh recording fees for real estate transactions so a lot of money is coming in from law firms paying for the recording fees uh marriage license applications cost money uh, handling uh the probate of estates and the filings that have to take place with all that um all, all those things you know we pay fees for so the money flows through the county clerk's office and it's my understanding uh that you know we're we're talking about on an annual basis hundreds of thousands of dollars that flow through the county clerk's office so the money is you know it's it it certainly is uh evident there and available if somebody has uh uh, ill designs on on handling that money the, the, the temptation can be there 
so uh, I think it's a fair question to ask uh, what systems are in place to make sure that we have people looking over each other's shoulders who are handling this money because of those known temptations to make sure that uh, the county proceeds are being handled appropriately. Uh, and, and I'm sure as part of this investigation, the systems analysis will take place. Joe, I promise the next time we get in touch with you, actually, I really can't promise you that. <laughs> yeah, be careful. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's going to happen today. Can we talk about something other than criminal behavior? <laughs> Who knows what's coming tomorrow? I don't, I don't know. We've been on a bit of a roll here. Uh, so, yeah. And all, but in all serious notes, this note, though, Joe, the, the important thing is that eventually uh, these things are being investigated and, and they are going in front of a grand jury. And the processes that are in place are being utilized to make sure that people are accountable at all levels. Yeah, well, well said. And, and our job uh, at the radio station is to make sure that people are aware uh, that, yes, yeah, sometimes there are failings and sometimes there are accusations of, of misconduct, but there's a process in place and we'll, you know, we'll have to be patient as that works its way through the court system, as we've seen in the past. And, and uh, you, you trust the system to, to ferret these people out and, and, and if, if it's necessary and appropriate to be punished. Uh, so, um, you know, everybody should hold their fire uh, when it comes to these public officials who are accused of wrongdoing and let's see how it plays out. Good stuff. Joe, thanks so much. Appreciate your time this morning as always. Have a great day, sir. Okay, fellas, you too.